Great. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. For those of you who I haven't met yet, I'm Kara Hanlon. I'm the acting co-director of alumni relations for the GSB. A little inside scoop on this event. This event was actually scheduled to take place at Sesame in New York back in May. And well, of course, we'd, we'd love to be, you know, doing this in person. We always like to recognize the silver linings of this situation. And not only were we able to invite our GSB alums outside of the New York area to join, but we were able to extend this invitation to all Stanford alumni and students. So we're so glad that so many of you could join for this special event. And in the spirit of also giving other thanks, I wanted to give a huge shout out to Alicia Ducara. She's the Director of Philanthropic Development for Sesame Workshop. She has been my partner in crime and absolutely instrumental in making this event happen. So Alicia, thank you so much to you and continuing to work with me on this program. So on that note, I wanna share a little bit more about Sesame. So Sesame Workshop is the nonprofit organization behind the beloved and trusted television show, Sesame Street. Sesame Workshop is on a mission to help children everywhere grow smarter, stronger, and kinder. Generations of children have grown up watching Sesame Street, but Sesame Workshop is behind much more than just the pioneering television show. For over 50 years, they've combined the power of media and Muppets to teach important early lessons, foster emotional well being, and help families cope with everyday challenges. So today we are joined by Steve Youngwood, who's from the GSB class of 1997. He is the COO and president of media and education at Sesame Workshop. And huge congratulations to Steve. As of January 1st, Steve will assume the role of CEO of Sesame Workshop. Steve has a, had a career in children's media and education. And today we get to hear more about his path from the GSB to his view from the top of the street or Sesame Street. But before we hear from Steve, I want to mention that those of you who feel compelled to learn more about Sesame Workshop and how you can become involved and support their incredible work in both the US and abroad, you can do so by visiting sesameworkshop.org. But also they're putting together a pretty fantastic and fabulous generous raffle of Sesame swag and all of you can enter to win. So um, Ramon's going to drop that link in the chat now. We'll also follow up with more information about how to join the raffle. But go ahead and feel free to enter now or later. Should you wanna learn more, you can reach out to me. I can connect you with someone on the Sesame staff, or of course you can direct message any of them or Alicia in particular during this event. And last but not least, and then I will definitely stop talking. I am so pleased to introduce our incredible moderator, Sheila Jamarajan. She is from the MBA class of 06. Sheila is not only a longtime volunteer with the New York chapter, but she is currently the chair of the GSB Alumni Association Board. Sheila has a beyond impressive resume. She's currently the head of investor relations and business development at ZMC. Since we're limited on time and we know you're here to hear this event, I also wanted to just share one more fun fact about Sheila, and that is that she was previously an on-air television reporter for CNBC and Bloomberg, Bloomberg Television, where she regularly reported on a wide range of business news and breaking stories. So clearly, we have a professional moderator today. We are in good hands. And I've had the gift of working for, with Sheila for a little over four years now. Um, and I can honestly say that Sheila is just one of the most incredibly thoughtful, kind, insightful, wicked smart, has a huge heart, and is totally committed to strengthening the GSB and broader Stanford alumni community. So while I get to say this in front of a lot of people, I want to say thank you to Sheila, not only for co-hosting this event, but for all that you do for the GSB. We are so grateful for you. And with that, I'll hand it off. Thank you so much. Those are very tough words to follow, so I hope I am up to the task here. Uh, first of all, I want to say welcome, welcome, welcome to everyone. Um, there are over 200 of you registered for today's speech. So Steve, I think that speaks to everyone's interest in you and your career and what is happening at Sesame Workshop. And I want to hit on that for one second, because as soon as that music played, you know, I was talking about Sesame Street and Sesame Workshop at breakfast this morning. And the first question I got asked by my eight-year-old son and my five-year-old daughter is, can we have an autograph of Cookie Monster and also Big Bird? So I'm going to hold you to that. Um, high, high demand here. They're usually never interested in what I do, but there was a lot of interest in this one. And I know there's a lot of interest in general because it really touches, I think, everyone. 
Sesame Workshop, Sesame Street, the characters have really hit so many kids, parents, generations around the world. And I think that is the beauty of it. That is the gem of it. And we really look forward to talking a lot more about that today. But as you know, View from the Top is equally as much about your own personal leadership story. Uh, a lot of what we're gonna talk about is your journey, some of your decisions, how you thought about things. And those are all things that folks wanna get into. So with that, welcome again. Thank you so much for being here. We could not be more excited to have you. Um, I'm gonna kick it off with, before you join Sesame Street, a little bit about your personal journey. Um, you went to, you, you had a very illustrative uh, consulting career. You had a lot of experience there. Then you went to business school. And then as you were graduating business school, you decided not to go to consulting. You decided not to go back to the job you came into. Just try to go back to that mindset Talk to us about what you were thinking and why you decided to go to corporate media as your next step. Yeah, um, so first of all, thank you. Hello to everyone and thank you um, for having me. It was uh, back in 97, as you alluded to, I had um, before I had four years between college and graduate school, one of which was just spent studying abroad in Germany and three of which were working at McKinsey, both in Cleveland and back in Germany. And I remember, you know, I was a history major. So McKinsey in many ways was my sort of business 101. And I probably learned more in that than almost any years of my life. Uh, but I also learned about myself. I learned that, you know, while I liked the intellectual stimulation and the variety of consulting, I always felt at the end there was something, you know, um, unfulfilling that I, I wanted to actually go own what I was recommending and sort of be accountable for it versus moving on every sort of three to six months. So I concluded, okay, I want to go down the operating route. You know, some of going to Stanford was, I mean, part of it was, you know, after three years of consulting and not knowing what hotel room to go into each night, it was a burnout. But a lot of it was, uh, you know, being able to step back, knowing I wanted to likely make a pivot, you know, uh, getting broader exposure, broader exposure to people. Um, there was a personal side specifically about Stanford. I was an East Coast person, both in terms of where I grew up and, you know, where I went to school. Um, thinking I'd wanted to come back, but knowing that I, I needed to get exposure to that, the entrepreneurial um, sort of ethos of the California, let alone Stanford. So I, uh, then it was always like, if I did go into industry, what does it mean? You know, as much as I like the intellectual stimulation of moving from one industry to another at consulting, it also told me that anything can be interesting, but I need to connect with the product. I need to be sort of energized with the product and, uh, you know, I always looked from the outside of media that while I was not a uh, struggling creative, there are people that go into media companies as business or lawyers, but really they want to go be a writer. That was never me. I was at least said that much of sort of um, self-understanding. But I do know I loved being around the creative atmosphere and being around sort of the ideas and that um, certainly then, but even more so today, you know, media... Um, can shape behavior, media can shape perspectives, and media emotionally connects with people. So I kind of said, at least from the outside, that seemed interesting. Throw in the business mind of me, which was that like at, at the time, you, you know, media was about brands and brands are emerging across platforms. So there were a lot of interesting strategic issues. So kind of combining those two, I'm one of the few people that when I wrote, uh, I think few, I don't have the stats, but my essay for one of my essays for getting to Stanford was about what do you want to do when you grow up? And it was, oh, I want to go run a division or a media company. And so I kind of had that vision then. I actually um, sort of pursued it and, you know, have fulfilled it in many ways. So that was really it. It was, um, you know, wanting to move into the operating side and, and an area that I really connected. And uh, kids particularly, I was open then, but, you know, kids and the educational slant, uh, you know, uh, was yet another motivator in terms of the way media can move people for, for good, but also just the fun of it and maybe never really wanting to grow up. <laughs> um, you talked about the pervasiveness of media. One of the things that also strikes me about media about is how much it's quickly changing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think about the past 20 years, so much has changed about big media, small media, new media, old media. I mean, there's all these phrases around media, all of which get to the fact that it's changing all the time. Take us a little bit back to 1997 when you decided to go to Viacom. Um, what was happening in big mm -hmm. media then? What was the mindset? What were you looking at as you entered your new job? Yeah. 
So in 97, it was um, before the dot, the real sort of the, the dot com, the first dot com bust. Mm -hmm. shall I say. So it was just about, we graduated in 97, a few, uh, you know, people with vision would go to, I think Yahoo was existing. There was a company called At Home, but it was certainly pre-Google days and, and et cetera. Media was, there were probably two things going on. There was a first phase of sort of media conglomerates of them, you know, basically pulling together the various segments, whether it be TV or, you know, movie studios or some print, if you can believe it back in the day. But the other thing that was going on was when you really looked into it, the, the, the cash cow was cable TV, uh, um, where now it's basically the albatross of any actual uh, media company and cable TV, not from a distributor perspective, but from a channel you know, perspective. Uh, and um, Viacom particularly was, um, that was their, they did have some conglomerate stuff that they had bought a book publisher, they had bought Paramount Studios, they'd even bought Blockbuster, uh, but they had a core assets of uh, cable TV. And cable TV was the cash code because it was the, it was the business model that um, you could never beat. It was, you had a lot of things, it was dual revenue stream. So you had ad sales and, you know, consumer pays a, for cable, and then a part of that goes to the content holder. You had a high, you had a low variable cost model. So, you know, if you serve 10 people or 10 million people, the cost didn't really change. So as you scaled, the margins got better. You had a kind of a wholesale retail model where you made a channel, you gave it to a cable operator, they did all the marketing. They had all the sort of infrastructure investment. And you had a time where it was growing um, rapidly in terms of more homes, uh, uh, more homes, um, you know, subscribing to cable or eventually satellite. And then it had this high barriers to entry because there were a limited number of channels. So once you were a channel, um, it was hard to kick you out. And because of technology reasons at the beginning, you know, first you had something called analog and maybe there were 50, then it went up to digital, maybe there were 150 to 200, but there was a limit. So it was a, the race then was how do I launch more channels? How do I get that real estate? Because once you're in the club, you can't get kicked out. Obviously downstream, the thing that imploded, it was this thing called the internet, which took away that um, barrier to entry uh, that had sustained people for so long. But I remember as back in the day, you'd show up and, you know, cable would grow 10% and, you know, you would get extra ad sales and extra affiliate fees and you were just, and people would pay extra money and you'd grow 30% by really just sitting back. And it was a closed ecosystem. So you didn't have any of this on demand stuff. So even if you didn't have great pro, you had a good show at eight and a good show at nine, you just put a piece of uh, low cost stuff at eight 30, but people would sit there and watch it anyway, because they didn't really have a lot of uh, choices. So that's what was going on. You had the first phase of media conglomerates, and then you had a big emphasis on cable TV, which allowed people to super target certain niches and did it in an incredibly um, attractive business model with high barriers to entry. So as I hear you describe the state of the media industry, then it's almost a very classic consulting approach to it, almost like a Porter's Five. Like, mm -hmm. How much of that is now hindsight as you look back in terms of where the industry was then versus when you came in there, were you able to start to see some of those cracks in big media? Were you, were you starting to see how maybe there could be kind of new threats or competitive threats coming about? I think at the beginning, again, 97 was when I went out there. It was uh, early enough that you, um, I mean, you kind of, I view life in five-year sort of increments. And it's like, where do you want to be in five years? And then you work backwards. I think that was really, uh, that was about execution. And it was race because the, you know, the economics were great. Um, the ability to super serve an audience were great. In many ways, what Viacom was was ahead of its time in the sense of like, as opposed to general entertainment, you know, you build ecosystems, you bring brand, build brand loyalty. In terms of seeing the, um, it's an interesting question. In, in retrospect, I don't think if, if I'm, could people have predicted uh, uh, what would happen? Uh, probably, uh, I would say it's. A, I haven't really thought about it in particularly that way. Uh, I would say at that time, no, by the time I got to 2000, 2001, when you understood what the ramifications of the internet, where it wasn't a matter of um, if, it was a matter of when that things like bandwidth developed. So it would actually be 
a disruptor to video-based services versus you know, first starting, say, print-based for services and classified industries. And the that is where in the foresight, and that's where you also get to one of those lessons, is the problem when you have a great business model, it's hard to be willing to disrupt. And if you recall, it was back in the days of the saying was, I'm going to trade um, analog dollars for digital pennies, you know, and even if you had the foresight to pivot and you could kill it in the digital, it was still 10 cents on the dollar. Right. And so it was, uh, again, those lessons learned, um, it would have taken a lot of fortitude and foresight, um, both from the company as well as the investors and the narrative for you to say that I know where the future is. So let me, um, let me get there. And if you recall, some people who thought they saw the future like Time Warner uh, by buying someone like an AOL, you know, th they didn't see the future correct or they right. saw it early. As they say, sometimes it's a matter of you may be right, but your timing may be wrong. Right. And so. You mentioned the words fortitude and foresight. And I think about where you were at, at that time in your career, right? So you're at this great media company with iconic brands. You have MTV, you have Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. um, you have what I also call a very cool business card. Like you had a great gig there, right? Mm -hmm. you, were, you were there, you were very successful there. What gave you the fortitude and insight to use your words to be like, you know what? I think it's time for me to get out. Like, I think it's time for me to move on. Like, that's a really tough decision. Mm -hmm. What was going on through your head then? Yeah, I think there were, you know, I, uh, and this is more in the hindsight, you kind of ask your questions. I mean, I've been there a long time. So that this is not one, I, I spent a good 16 years there. So I will give my credit for fortitude and, and, and insight, but um you know, it was after a lot of thoughtful sort of reflection. So there were a couple of things. One, there was the industry perspective. It was the beginning of when things were starting to, where the internet was becoming a reality and Netflix was getting, a, you know, its traction and you started to understand the, the ecosystem wasn't as closed and that, you know, people were shifting to, there were more alternatives and there were more competitors. Um, than you had before, which starts to implode the whole sort of um, economic system. Because as I told you, it was a high fixed cost. It was a low variable cost, high fixed cost business. So once your users go down, you're stuck with the same cost, but less revenue. Uh, so within the environment, it, you started to realize that it was becoming, how do I decline less versus how do I grow, which is not a very satisfying thing. As you say, it really would take sort of fortitude and insight to um, to realize, you know, to, to do that pivot. And I do think there's some companies that did it, like, you know, Disney recognized their foresight was they recognized that if you own brands and IP, then no matter how the technology and the distribution platforms evolved, that, um, that you could pivot with it. And that's when they bought Marvel and they bought Star Wars and they eventually bought Pixar. And those are kind of uh, platform agnostic from that, you know, perspective. Um, and that was probably a foresight that if um, other companies could have had that they could have pivoted. But then there was the personal side, you know, the personal side was partially because, you know, I, it's always, you know, where do you want to go in five years? And are you getting there? You know, and I had, as much as I had loved what I had done, and I had was energized, I had done, was doing, uh, you know, I realized that, you um, I wanted as big of a job. I had a big media company. Uh, I was not going to become the CEO. And even if you are the CEO, who knows how you, you feel at a big media company and you're kind of a cog in a wheel. It's sort of wonderful when it all works together, but there's that personal thing. I always said to myself, I want to know what I really can do and what I really can sort of lead and, 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 and run. And while that other filter of doing it a place that I kind of connect and can believe in the product and believe that um, even if I'm not solving cancer, there's something relatively uh, societally value added that I'm doing. And I kind of realized that, you know, the longer you stay, I mean, if I do career lessons, like the longer you stay at a big company, the more you become expert at working at a big company. And so if you want to go, you know, run something, uh, the, there's a tipping, there's no magic time, but I was a little bit over 40 or, or at the time. And I was like, you know what? Uh, if my goal is to come CEO and run something that I believe in, until you are a CEO, you're not going to get a CEO job. And so it was time for me to start looking and, you know, finding that right next opportunity. And, you know, fortunately, you know, fortunately it was both feeling like 
I it wasn't, I didn't have the next de level of development individually, but then also as a company that was, um, I wasn't quite sure where the next step would be. Um, still doesn't make it an easy decision because then uh, that's the first decision. And then what do you want to do is the next decision. But th that's what sort of drove me. It's like I had made that commitment myself okay, in five years from now or whatever, 10 years from now, if I don't give myself the challenge of um, running something that I believe in where I think I can make impact and, and help, then I'll have regrets. So in some ways, the bigger risk would have been me saying or um, trying to find an equivalent job versus me going and finding the type of job I was fortunate enough to find. I know a lot of people who are listening into this probably have felt what you felt at that time at some point in their career, right? Like you're at a company for a long time, you're doing really well, you're, you're getting paid well. Um, there's something in you that wants to move on, but it's really hard to give that up. Uh, mm -hmm. A big part of that is the personal side of it and trying to assess the downside and what's going to happen mm -hmm. if I go off this track. How did you think about that? Did you think about how do I think about my downside capping it? Um, what was your personal situation at the time? A lot of times people feel trapped because, you know, mm -hmm. they don't think they can afford or, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's financially or emotionally to, to kind of take that big swing. What was going on then? Yeah, my personal situation, because um, everyone's personal situation by definition it, it is different. So I always say sort of full, I, I do have a, you know, you can, and you figure out your life priorities. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of my one life priority, because this was a constraint, is I knew I needed to be in New York um, because of my personal situation. So, okay, that was, that was a box that I sort of played in. And that was because of my, really my wife and her situation, her job. Uh, but she did also, she was, she had a job. And so, you know, money's all relative, but I sort of just said, you know, we had a, you can always maybe want more money, but we had a financial situation where I figured that we felt comfortable. And from a financial perspective, I could afford to take that risk and my, which it made, while it was a closed aperture of, um, I need to be in New York, there was a closed aperture of, you know, I wanted to go to a company that I felt like I really um, sort of connected with and believe with that we're doing. There was an open aperture was those two were more important than, you know, how do I make multiple millions of dollars? And that was the kind of the decision I made when, and as a family that we made, and it closes some options, um, particularly when you're saying only New York and you, know, you get a million phone calls from California of some fantastic, great companies, particularly as a Stanford person. Um, but it opened up other amp apertures where I could really say, what is the situation that I both the environment, the product, and where I think I can add value and make a difference given my background, plus given what I, I believe in. And that was what I kept telling myself. Most important thing was the job and the, and the fulfillment and, you know, that sense of uh, making a difference, you know, versus just what's going to be the next IPO or et cetera. So we're going to get to Sesame Workshop in a second, I promise. Um, you worked at Nickelodeon Viacom for 16 years, though, as you said. Mm -hmm. As you reflect upon it, I think about my own career track. I feel like every segment of my life, I learned a couple of things which I was able to mm -hmm. take on to where I am now. Um, what are the kind of big key takeaways you took from working at a place like Nickelodeon? Mm -hmm. One of the things particularly, and Viacom was interesting this way because it was kind of a house of brands. And... Um, I learned, you know, one of the, 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 and this you'll see it carries to Sesame too, is that Nickelodeon was, and still is, but truly sort of um, was incredibly successful. It, it came, it kind of was enabled from some missteps of, of Disney. And one of the enablers was it had a very simple brand promise. It would basically said, Nick is for kids. It had a very simple concept that it started that. And I was there 20 some years later, and that concept was still relevant, which is very simply at the time, it was that there was no place um, kids could watch TV, but there was no place they could call home. And so their initial founders, this woman, Jerry Laybourne and others kind of came up with this positioning is like, we want a place that is kids, it was a little bit of an us versus them, but it was a kids only, but it really was that at any time of day, kids could turn on and they could feel that they are at home. And what I learned was that the strength of brands, the strength of having a simple brand proposition that is your, you know, North Star, and that guides your decisions, both from a creative and a brand and even a hiring, you know, per perspective. And it, 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 it just gives clarity and sense of purpose. And then it also enables you to connect deeply with an audience. You also realize from that, the strength of a brand is your it, a brand is your strength. It gives you a ceiling and a and a floor, you know, because it it ideally it's 
stretchable, but it means you can go certain places and, and not other places. Uh, uh, the Nick example was that it was founded as a TV place and, and we were able to expand beyond TV, but you know, that's a little bit of a, you know, there are always limits because of how people sort of see you and, and evolve over time. And I'd see MTV was a cousin brand and that was an interesting one. That standard started as a simple premise as well, which is about music. Uh, for strategic reasons, they went beyond music. Uh, it was business reasons was a sort of an interesting thing. They started as music videos, but then like radio, if a song comes on, you don't like, you change the channel. And so that wasn't good for ratings and that wasn't good for ad sales. So then you start getting to TV shows and then your brand starts trying pop culture and then you're starting competing against a million things. And, and that's a brand that you see goes up and down because it became much more dependent on not a simple proposition, but more of the, the hit show. So I learned an incredible amount, the value of simple brand proposition, staying true to your brand and, and then sort of building up almost sort of a community and an ecosystem. The other thing I completely learned is that whole innovator's dilemma which is that you recognize when you're in it. And um, again, push yourself to recognize when you're in it, push yourself to what does five years, 10 years look like, and then build your strategy backwards. Much easier to see five and 10 years than arguing over when will something happen in two years or three years. Um, but I definitely experienced the, the, the challenge of the innovator's dilemma uh, in that Viacom didn't know how to wasn't willing to sort of cannibalize itself. And then within that, the whole issue of like, how do you evolve out of your, you have a core expertise and how do you uh, evolve past that if the market that demands it? Hmm. So let's talk about Sesame Workshop now. I mean, mm -hmm. iconic brand, like I said, I think every single person who is here today listening to this has some memory of Sesame Street character, some association with Sesame Workshop. I cannot also think of a better brand in terms of embodying the GSB motto of change lives, change organizations, change the world. And I have to admit, when we had spoken before this interview, I learned a lot about the history of Sesame Street. Um, mm -hmm. Very importantly, I learned it was nonprofit. And one of the groundbreaking things that we had talked about was really this unique mix of being mission driven, yes, commercially oriented. Can you give the group here just a, a quick thumbnail in terms of the history of Sesame Street and that that unique combination of the two because you're seeing a lot more organizations trying to do that today and this mm -hmm. is a, this is a company that did it you know 30 40 years ago mm -hmm. so sesame uh, was founded in 1969 and it was kind of alluded to nickelodeon though in a very different way it was a simple observation and a simple concept uh, it was founded by a woman named uh joan dance cooney and lloyd morissette both of who are still alive and it was that simple, it was in the 60s, there was a lot of sort of uh, social activity and social unrest and attention around the education gap. And remember Lloyd saw his daughter at the time, just staring, getting up at 5.30 a.m. before TV actually turned on and he, she would just stare at it because she was in such anticipation. And I, him, him seeing from his perch as a parent, but let alone also someone in philanthropy that, you know, this. TV thing, which was the technology day, was really powerful. Uh, and they, he and uh, she, he and um, Joan would have the observation, you know, you watch their kids, they would learn the words to beer commercials. And they would say, it's clearly not a question if kids are learning from TV, it's a question about what kids are learning from TV. And then there's that dot connecting. It's like, wow, if you could harness the power of TV to help educate kids, you know, could you really make a di big difference with all kids, but most particularly, you know, those that are most vulnerable and help close the um, education gap, or at least um, lessen the slope. That was the founding principle, which is how do you um, take, harness the power of media to help educate kids? Uh, it was founded as a goal of uh, educating, but it knew that they had to entertain in order to educate. So versus a traditional media company, the end goal is education and entertainment is a means to an end. They put together a team of people, great creators, great researchers, and even people from the advertising community to take a lot of the lessons from commercials. It's one of the reasons the initial set or Sesame is still a magazine format type of show because there's always like, let's do an ad for the letter C. And by Ooh. the end of the time, the people will let, uh, 
um, uh, will know the letter C, and then by the end of the thing, they'll um, know the whole alphabet. It was back in the days, you can imagine, uh, where it was linear TV and six channels. It was not on demand in 5,000 channels. And so it was literally supposed to be preschool on TV. So for all the kids at the time, maybe only 30% of kids went to preschool and 70% were home. So you tune in, there'd be 150 episodes, almost like a soap opera. And you knew that the kid watched the Monday episode before the Tuesday episode, the Tuesday episode before the Wednesday in the episode. So it was like a lesson plan, but all sort of clouded in, um, in the drip of sort of an educational show with their beloved characters like Big Bird and at the time, Kerbin, et cetera. And sure enough, they did it. Studies came back and oh my God, this thing works. And it was, um, again, one of your also sort of perfect philanthropic models because it was seed funded by places like the Carnegie Foundation, the Ford Foundation, some of the government. But then it kind of got a life of its own because of accidentally, but it got mass appeal. Uh, things like licensing revenue sort of started coming in. And um, so it could start self-funding itself still as a not-for-profit. And then sort of what became, was originally the most sort of quintessential American institution, uh, you know, got phone calls from Germany, got phone calls from Mexico, and got phone calls from Brazil, and quickly became a global uh, phenomenon uh, within a five-year period, both um, being beloved, both having impact, uh, uh, and, and then, and both, um, you know, being sustainable. And so it was really a, a, a magical thing. And where we are today, you know, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary. And that simple premise, which is how do you harness the power of media? Uh, how do you focus on early childhood education? That's where we started because you have, um, that, that's where you can have the longest uh, or the greatest long-term impact when you look at sort of kids, um, you know, brain develop. How do you harness media? Because media is innately very scalable and media, uh, media can actually really engage? And how do you infuse research into it to make sure that you uh, engage a kid, you have impact, and you make a difference for their um, sort of whole life? Again, then it was the technology, the day was TV. Now it's video broadly defined, no matter what platform it is, uh, whether it's, it's interactive, it's print materials. Uh, technology has enabled us today. You still have mass media, the, the pro of mass media is you get broad-based distribution. The con of mass media is that it's one message for all. And so in, in today's, um, uh, the enabling of digital, let alone lots of different um, channels, we do a lot of uh, much more targeted work, started um, going after more targeted um, uh, communities, lots of, particularly in the US around trauma, et cetera, where on the, on the internet, it can be opt-in. So if you're a, um, you know, whether it's homelessness, children, people, kids going through trauma, because trauma is a, uh, is a blocker to learning. We can do a lot of targeted work on the internet and video, internet, you know, delivered video around kids, um, you know, of kids of parents with opioid addiction, kids of parents with, um, from military families and et cetera. While on the show and mass media, we can address issues that are appropriate for all kids. So you talked a little bit about the origin of Sesame and a, a little bit about some of the things you're doing today. Let's talk about that in between because there's a lot that's happened in between. And mm -hmm. particularly when you chose the time when you went to the company, it was a very different story in terms of what was happening at Sesame. In fact, it was pretty negative, right? Can you mm -hmm. take us back to exactly some of the issues that you were facing, um, what was going on and how you were thinking about it? Mm -hmm. So I joined the workshop in 2015. We had just, um, a new CEO had been announced or in the fall of 2014. And it was an interesting situation because on the one hand with media proliferation and fragmentation, kids were consuming more media here and around the world more than, than ever before. I think whether it was more or less, I think everyone could argue there's still an education gap and there's still, um, many pockets of, uh, broadly speaking, but there was a great need to help particularly the early, youngest kids here and around the world with various educational issues. So the reason, Joan and Lloyd's initial sort of reason for being was as relevant as ever. Having said that, <laughs> the kind of the environment, the rules and the strategies needed to sort of execute that vision had dramatic, and the economic model behind it had dramatically changed. And so you had Sesame was an interesting institution. It was a story institution, probably in the mid forties at the time. It was a global institution that had lots of multiple generations growing up with it. Uh, it had a, from a not for, mission driven not-for-profit, its mission was as relevant as ever, but it was 
you know, in trouble. It was um, because the rules had changed the financially, it was losing money. It was the brand was degrading, the viewership was fragmenting. And that and then that always has a sort of a domino effect that leads to layoffs, it hurts the culture, it gets harder to attract good people, it's hard to get people motivated. You start doing a little bit of mission creep because you do whatever you can to, you know, to to keep the financials um, running. And so it was a tough time, uh, as relevant as an ever mission, but uh, didn't have the kind of the body was not strong to execute it. So the board made uh, one fundamental decision. They, they recognized that. And for the first time in their history, they went outside of the organization to, to bring in a CEO. And which is a very risky move. I mean, that can either really work or it can really blow up. I mean, we've it, seen examples of both. Yeah, it was, and and then I'll again my lessons learned um, from it. So they did. There were probably three things, and that was the top level decision. And then the CEO made a decision to go outside for a COO and outside for a new chief creative officer. And so it was, and all of which for a mission driven not for profit, they went for for profit, com, you know, commercially grounded people. So th those were the two decisions because. Uh, they realized that, um, you know, for success, they needed an outside perspective, an outside perspective um, that was schooled in the media industry because that was a core to delivery of the mission. Uh, now, the caveats, I will say, the things I sort of learned at the time was that you kind of like, what are your lessons learned? Because I can say the end of the story is we we're not, we've turned it around, we've got great momentum. That doesn't guarantee future success, but we're in a good place right now is we had in, and I look at all the things that were sort of uh, lessons learned from it. It was brought in people from the outside to bring outside perspectives. Because one of the things that was, um, that the pivot the workshop hadn't done was as a mission-driven profit, a not-for-profit with, um, you know, big ambitions, uh, we were as good as our partners. So you needed an externally oriented group of people who also had that network. We also need enough people who had been there um, for a long time that had it in them to pivot. Because I like to say, if you only had, if it only brought in the CEO, a lot of new ideas get squashed. When you bring enough new people, I remember when I took the job, I had a, you know, a, a lunch with a former head of Nickelodeon, this guy Herb Scannell, and he says, like, I don't know if you, if Jeff, new CEO, can do it, but you and Jeff together, maybe you have a chance. And so you get enough outsiders um, that uh, new ideas don't get squashed by the old culture, but enough insiders, you know, to keep the heart and soul of the organization, and you know, to have that good dialogue and debate on what change is too much and what change is actually good. And it was the combination. If I ever told people, "Hey, you turn around 101," that's one of them, which is enough outsiders, but enough insiders that you can meld the two and keep that north star. Uh, and then it starts to get, once you get the right people, then you get the structure. Uh, and then you get the right priorities and figure out, okay, what do I have to do? It's not about a five-year plan at that point. It's about a, uh, figure out where you want to be in five years, but then it's a series of three months, six months, and, 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 and one-year plans uh, to, to help you, you get there. And there were a series of moves um, that sort of led success, uh, uh, leads to success. And uh, some of it was skill, and maybe some of it was a little bit, of, bit of luck. But um, you know, we sort of we we've gotten to where we've gotten to right now. You're, it's very eloquent in terms of how you're speaking about a turnaround. I think all of us have probably been in some level of a turnaround situation in whatever job you're in right now. And what I do know, and I'm sure what many people have experienced, is that it. <laughs> really tough. I mean, I'm sure there were moments that you were like, oh my God, what did I just get myself into? Why am I doing this? Um, again, talking about that personal side of leadership, how do you get through those? I mean, those can be very devastating, not only to you, but in, in terms of managing an organization, talk about how you, how you thought about that um, personally, as well as manifesting that to your team and, and the group that you were running. This is probably where the fortitude and conviction comes sort of the, the most, um, you know, we had a few things early on. One was the hard one when you're changing some people who've been there a long time. Um, we had the, I will say we had the advantage because um, where I am now in a very different state. We had the advantage of like, sometimes you, you don't want to let a good crisis go to waste. And w we had one, you know, we were losing, I don't know, like $15 million a year. I mean, what had fundamentally happened from a business model to the workshop was it was a model where you'd 
basically the, the, the core show, you'd give it away to PBS so you can deliver a mission and have impact and you'd make money on things like DVDs and products. Well, DVDs went away and product license got fragmented. So you're losing $15 million um, a year. Yes, we had a big operating reserve, but you do the math, you know where that's gonna end up. So we, we had the crisis and then how do you use that sort of wisely? I think that you, and you also had the cynicism, like, oh, you're a bunch of for-profit guys coming in. You don't really know what mission is. Um, and so you, we had to prove ourselves. And a lot of it is confidence in yourself, which is to say, like, listen, um, we are, um, I mean, had a phrase, which may sound more money, the more mission. And that you know, we, uh, you, you figure out where you, I always kind of break it out as like, wh where do you want to end up? You said, well, the reason, uh, you know, I say, I always hire people mission driven, but market oriented or commercially oriented, because you look at our mission, our reason for being is to help kids. Um, and then what are the building blocks to do that? Well, you need mass media brand engagement and distribution. Well, you're competing against Paw Patrol. So you, you need that um, sort of mindset. A not-for-profit's economic model usually is you get restricted grants, which is uh, really important, and then you need unrestricted money because restricted grants never cover the overhead. And there are two ways to do it. One is earned revenue, like uh, the ballet sells theater tickets, the hospital charges certain patients more than others, you know, or you get unrestricted. Uh, unrestricted is hard to get. So uh, even though the, the means to an end is you need that commercial mentality combined with the mission driven so that you can get the mass, you can get the brand, and then you can help get unrestricted um, money so you, we can serve those that are most vulnerable. Going back to the tipped over, you know, the, the fortitude, it was, I mean, to be honest, it was a little bit conviction in your plan, conviction in what you feel, and then fingers crossed <laughs> that you will um, prove yourself. And I think what happened with us, that's why I say some skill, um, you know, some luck, uh, we uh, got the right people in place, we put the right structure, um, and then we set the right priorities. Some of the structure thing was this recognition as a um, sort of a unique uh, not for, for, for profit is that we, um, but also sort of a luxury. We have two ways of raising money. We had philanthropic ways, which really goes to the, everything's mission driven, it goes to work that there is no economic model you know, whether it's serving the kids of military families, there's no economic model there. That's purely philanthropic. Then you have mass media and everything that comes with it, which is really the basic models of children's media. You make content, you distribute it, you can uh, make money off, off licensing that's derivative or, you know, themed entertainment experiences. That's commercially supported. Everything's going to be on brand, everything's going to be mission driven. But, you know, we put kind of two groups in place that were all about the mission, but said, this is what you do. And this is what you do. You kind of set people up so they're, they, they're accountable people and you give them something to be accountable for, you know, with clear goals and that set it into place. And then you go to the priorities. The number one priority was fixing the financial situation and elevating the brand. Because once you do that, then you get off your heels and you can start leaning forward. And the hypothesis that we recognized, which again, took an outsider to do was that it was the beginning of the SVOD arms race. And so there it's even just for our audience who may not know what SVOD yeah, means. Right. Just... Yeah, SVD is subscri it's the Netflix of the world. It's the over the top, um, whether it's Amazon, whether it's Netflix, whether it's Hulu, subscription video on demand. And that the old workshop had this philosophy of, which is an interesting conundrum within media, that if I make something accessible everywhere, then more people see it. Well, the reality is when you make something accessible everywhere, then none of your partners value it. So they don't promote it and no one sees it. And access and um, uh, consumption are not necessarily the same thing. And so we, uh, we walked in the workshop would distribute things everywhere. And um, we came in and said, okay, you know, we've got a, there aren't that many, it's an arms race. People are trying to differentiate themselves. We had one of the most premium brands and that's where we ended up doing a partnership, which was, uh, with HBO, uh, which gave them the first window and we convinced PBS to be okay with taking the second window because the alternative was we can't make the content anymore. And that was the sort of the, the, the spark that set everything forward.
because we um, financially fortified ourselves, uh, which we, uh, HBO is one of those few organizations where they were as relevant in new media than old media. So we kind of made, we kind of elevated the brand in, you know, both employees' minds as well as, as um, the trades minds like, wow, if HBO, home of Game of Thrones, chose us to enter the kids space with Sesame, then Sesame must be a relevant brand. Right. Uh, we, they marketed it, you know, so, you know, so we were, PBS is our, was our core home. And then the other, you know, enabler in a fragmented world, we, um, the workshop used to be, in a fragmented world, it's hard to have the same impact with only one show, uh, let alone it's hard to create, creatively for an organization to feel vibrant when all you do is work on one thing. And so we got HBO to commit to doing more, you know, shows with us. And so that again, helped get people to look at us differently and helped uh, allow us to attract different types of talent. And again, the overall sort of proposition elevated the brand and put us on sort of financial standing. And even the employees, they suddenly got bonuses again, which they hadn't um, And not that we're a bonus driven culture, but we weren't laying people off. We were um, fairly compensating people uh, and that stabilized a lot of things. We had other partnerships, success breeds success. They're not one-to-one, but you start getting a partnership with, um, we just made big with IBM Watson and then the laser focus, philanthropic focus, uh, you know, became the first uh, sort of award winner of a hundred million dollars from MacArthur to just break through work that we're still doing right now. Uh, with the Syrian um, ref in the Syrian for refugees in the Syrian refugee region in Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, and um, and Syria, and again another hundred million dollar grant. We do we're launch partners with Apple on their new service, and now you sit here right now as we're in a situation where we're making more content and more types of content than the history of the workshop. We have bigger, bolder, um, pure philanthropically supported impact initiatives, both abroad around humanitarian and in the U.S. around you know trauma work than we've ever had in our history, and um, it all sort of started with those sort of basic propositions: build the new team in, figure out the structure, get the priorities, and then get that spark and that flywheel going to 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 bring us where we are today. So, Steve, I love that you admitted that there were times where you were just like fingers crossed. Um, I think that's really important for everyone to know that even top leaders and top companies have those moments and it's okay and it's normal to feel that and it's part of leadership. Mm -hmm. Um, In in a similar vein, you're here now, right? Fast forward to where you are now, a lot of success, some amazing, amazing work. As I hear you talk about, you know, addressing kids who have been uh, impacted by trauma or, you know, children with the Syrian refugee issues. Um, What keeps you up at night now? Like, what do you, what are you scared about now? So I always say uh, two things. One is uh, in this incredibly increasing sort of fragmented, you know, on-demand world is how do we keep actually having the impact? Uh, And because one of the things I always tell people if I'm interviewing people who don't come from the not-for-profit world is um, we're not about, um, we have a brand that stands for something, but we're not about perceived impact, we're actually about, about actual impact which is a much higher bar than perceived impact. So as this, if media is our main delivery vehicle, um, though we are getting into more community-based work, you know, it's a fragmented, complicated media uh, world and impact is dependent upon, you know, reaching people and dosage. And so, so that's one. I feel we're doing an amazing job, but it's a dynamic space. Uh, The other thing is, we um, in a, you know, we're, uh, I like to say we're a small, uh, we're a big brand, smallish organization with big ambitions. We're independent. Uh, we are as good as our partners because we get sort of virtual scale. We play in a lot of different sort of complexities. And so how do you, in, in a world where in, you know, tech, you know, the, the, there's a bigger and bigger concentration in terms of, um, how you reach audiences and the, and the gatekeepers and et cetera. So uh, the other thing means me is like, how do we continue? How do we make sure we have impact? And then how do we, even though we are small, how do we form the right partnerships and keep forming the right partnerships that uh, we can stand out in the way that we know we need to do? Uh, because we are not, we're not trying to be Google, but Google's the gateway to getting to, to, to people. Um, 
And you could list five other companies like that in the US and around the world, some of which are the same and some of which overlap. So th those are the two, two things, impact and how do we make sure we're reaching people as a ambitious, but on a relative world's small organization. So I'm conscious of the time and I do wanna leave some time for questions from the audience. I've gotten a couple here, uh, which I'm gonna go ahead and feed to you. One of the questions was, um, Sesame was relatively early to invest in the digital presence and has spent, has spent time building out your own ecosystem of interactive apps and games. How is Sesame leveraging research about child development and their approach to technology and app development? I know this is obviously a very prescient topic as many people are, are dealing with Zoom school and, and the pervasive use of technology and screens right now when it comes to children. Um, mm -hmm. And Sesame, of course, is, is the leader when it comes to the research aspect of that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, there, so um, it is a big topic in, in, in the sense that um, both because of the pandemic, but also like, you know, digitally, you know, video is our, is how we've made a difference and video is being digitally distributed, but interactively, where's the promise? So I, 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 we bring it out into two different buckets where we're looking at now. One is as a delivery vehicle, and there's some really interesting work, actually really, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, some stuff we're doing and reaching kids and families in an impactful way, both in Latin America and the Syrian refugee um, region through WhatsApp, as an example. Like, you know, we have this, uh, our, our MacArthur project which is again, trying to bring early childhood education to the most vulnerable children in the world, the ones um, you know, displaced in, in, that, um, in Syria and Lebanon and Iraq. And we did it two pronged. One is we did mass media, which is a TV program that um, uh, to help uh, the kids cope. And then we partnered with the IRC to do on the ground, much deeper interventions. Well, and this thing COVID came in along and you, know, you can't go into the camps. And so the question is like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? And that's where digital in that way, in a way that you can kind of almost individually and personalize, get the content that we had already made into their hands uh, in a way that's still impactful. And what's really great about that is now we're pivoting to doing, it wasn't on our plan originally, but we're doing research you know, with NYU to prove the efficacy on that. Because again, that, that, that makes mass media scalable. If, if we pull that one, you know, it's targeted media is scalable and we're doing the same thing in, in Latin America. The other thing we do, we just announced a partnership uh, with um, an organization called Homer, which we actually were on the board of them. They're a, they're a those who know the space, there's a, they're a subscription early learning service. And we are building a social emotional experience with them. And we always view in our cur curriculum, we don't think the world needs another interactive experience about how to read and how to do math. There are a lot of them out there, but we always view that while the cognitive skills are important, the building blocks to learning are things like social emotional. So we are very, and it's a lot where, even though, as I said, we started as a advertisement for the alphabet on the show, you know, we've evolved where we think we've had the greatest impact is on issues around emotional intelligence and social emotional, which are the building blocks to learning um, that if you don't have in place, you can't learn to read and you can't learn, learn to write. And media can be very powerful in that. So we are both trying to build a product around that is can we do what we've did in the video space in the interactive space? We don't think anyone has done that really, really well. And then trying to couple that with the research to sort of prove that it can be done and then hopefully uh, you know, makes a difference um, longer. But this is one I will say that you say this in terms of expertise, we're trying a lot digital, but this is also where we're smart enough to know we need partners because again, you, you can't be great at everything and uh, 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 but we can be great at managing a brand. We can be made educational sort of expertise and then trying to partner with people who are the, we have uh, complementary expertise to, to bring it to market. So I have one last very important question to ask you. Um, mm -hmm. This was also informed by my children and that is who is your favorite Sesame Street character? Uh, Big Bird. <laughs> I think that is a fan favorite, probably. Um, Steve, we're at the end of our time now. I want to say thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your entire team for helping us with this. You know, one of the things, at least that I've taken away, is that many of us have grown up with Sesame Workshop and Sesame Street and think about Big Bird or Elmo. I don't think a lot of us were really probably aware of the real fundamental impact that your mission has around the world and how it is truly impacting and helping children around the world. 
And it really makes me proud that someone from the GSB is playing such a pivotal role in that. So thank you. Um, I also wanna say as a reminder to our audience, uh, Sesame Workshop is a nonprofit. I would urge you to go to their website to learn about all the amazing things that they are doing. And we are in the giving season now. Um, please be generous if you, if you want to, to help support their activities. And with that, I wanna say thank you, thank you again. This has been amazing. And Kara, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you so much to Sheila and Steve for your time and giving us just at least a glimpse of the view from the street. Um, as Sheila said, this really showcases how incredible our alumni community is. What an impressive conversation. Um, so thank you again to Sheila and Steve. Thank you to Alicia and the entire team at Sesame. A reminder, if you wanna enter uh, the raffle to win some Sesame swag, you can do so via the link in the chat. And um, while this is one of our last alumni events of 2020, it, is, it has certainly been a tough year and that is an understatement. And um, we've, we've all had more than a few bad days. So in honor of Steve's favorite uh, Sesame Muppet, Big Bird, I'm gonna end with a quote from Big Bird and that's bad days happen to everyone, but when one happens to you, just keep doing your best and never let a bad day make you feel bad about yourself. So here's to uh, closing out 2020 and 2021 being a much better year. I hope all of you have healthy, happy holidays and thanks again for joining.